Ah, yeah, it's a new show. No longer poo show, but a new show called PB and JB. Packers, Bucks, and Jason and Ben. No, PB and HB. Packers, Buc- Packers Bucks, and Hafen Bros. Whatever. Anyway, who cares? It's, it's called a new opinions. show. Ben said opinions. Ben said he, he would never do a Packer outright opinion show again. Ben, it are sucks. You it's a great theme that? song written by me. Is it? What? Was it great? Let's hear it. Let's hear it. No, don't play it again. It's over. It's over? Don't play it again. Last week was the last time we hear that theme song. Laugh it up. Didn't even last a whole year. Well, you know what? I think you have a beef tonight. I you somebody's got a beef. I don't have a beef. I actually I'm gonna come to someone's defense today. <gasps> Devondre Campbell. Yes. <laughs> come on. That's how crazy I am right now. You're gonna this defend Packer off season has turned my opinions into insanity land. I don't even care anymore. I'm just saying whatever. I'm gonna I'm gonna defend Devondre Campbell, the most <laughs> indefensible human being on earth when it comes to Packers Twitter. He's also I'm delusional. He's also delusional. Even Brian Balaga, who has zero reaction to anything, got upset about Devondre Campbell's tweets. Brian Balaga, who, who who's like his emo, has the emotional uh, diversity of a toothpick. Yeah, that guy got upset about Devondre Campbell's tweets. But let's let's get into him because that's there's so much there to so unpack. Many tweets. So many tweets. Um, I'm drinking here. Uh, Giant Jones, it's a new one for me. I probably shouldn't do it on a Wednesday, but this one is a dark, strong ale. Ah. So dark and strong, but it's still an ale. It's weird because most ales aren't dark. That's why it's confusing. Anyway, what do you got about Devondre Campbell? Let's get into it. It started a few days ago, right? You're the one who who sent them all to me, and then I was like, well, he keeps going. He just remember his remember his one from in the season when he came back and played hurt. And then he got a bunch of crap because he played like trash. And then he's like, that's it. I'm never playing hurt again because you do. And then blah, 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 blah. And he was whiny and all this crap. And you're like, just play, dude. Anyway. And then now, now he's just, he got cut. He got released after getting 20 some million bucks from the Packers over the last couple of years for playing like garbage and being hurt. Right? Well, it's nothing compared to what David Bakhtiari made for doing nothing. I understand. I understand. But he still did not play well and got paid plenty. So now he's trashing them. Now he's just trashing them all. And well, everybody's trash. And what is he saying? What do you want you me to defend come it? I mean, De- I, I don't know what it. I can say. Defend it. De- defend Devondre. What do you got? Okay. I'm going to defend him first, and then we'll rip the shit out of him after that. Okay. So let's take a look at some of these tweets. First one that I see here is he's talking about the Packers coaching staff. Like his Kirk Obligadali, which I know I've already, I've mentioned many times on this show or on, on the previous show. This is a different show on the on the on the Pooh show, which no longer exists. I, plenty of times on that show about how Kirk Obligadali is a ding dong and a moron and should not be a coach in the NFL. Yet he's now the CL Seahawks linebackers coach, and they can have him. Uh, and then also, of course. The great Joe Barry, who's a ding dong. Devondre Campbell tweeted this, says, trust me, I know they don't watch the film. And half the time they don't know what's going on. And then he says, all year I was out there trying to make people right because they were busting coverages and run fits. Which means he's saying, everybody else sucks. The coaches are dumb. And I looked really bad because I was trying to help everybody else. Now, when you watch the film, Devondre Campbell pretty much just stands there and does nothing the entire time. So I don't know what the crap he's talking about here. But but here's the reason. Let's get into another tweet. Okay, here we go. Uh, Where is it? Uh, Okay. He talks about 2022-2023 season. I tried to be a team guy and play within the system and do what they asked. Be more visual on the quarterback and not look up routes. Back up from the line of scrimmage so I'm not pressing every wide receiver or tight end. Look at what happened. 
They had you- me and Quay out there looking clueless, shaking my head. That's another quick. So he's saying the coaches who don't look at film, he says, wanted him to back up, keep his eyes on the quarterback, not look for the routes. They said the coaches told him to not worry about where the receiver is or the tight end or the running backs are. Just look at the quarterback and just stand there. Because that's what he did. If you watch the film, he just stands there and looks at the quarterback. So I, this is why I'm defending Devondre Campbell. Okay. It's not his fault that he, that he was terrible. He oh. listened to his, if, if this is what his coaches said, the coaches told him, stand there eight yards back, look at the quarterback, ignore all receivers that come in your vicinity. And then it said, it said it had him and Quay looking like idiots out there, like they were clueless. Now, I'm almost positive even Kirk Obalabalabadali didn't tell him to stand there and do nothing looking at the quarterback and ignore all receivers that come into his vicinity. I'm pretty sure that's not what they told him. Or maybe that's all he heard. I don't know. But if this is what he was based, this is the only facts we have is Devondre Campbell's tweet storm, right? (laughs) You have to defend him then. He did exactly what he was told to do. Stand there. Look at the quarterback and do nothing. Don't tackle anybody. Miss tackles. Don't cover anybody. Don't, don't be pursue. If there's a guy around you. Don't pursue if the ball. Like what about don't all the running plays? The ball when the ball's in the air. Yep. Uh-uh. Wait until the guy gets catches it. Then try to tackle him. And then of course miss the tackle half the time. All uh, okay. Maybe they didn't tell him this tackle half the time. That he did on his own. I can't defend that. But I based on those two tweets. Okay. And then there's another one. He talks about his. His all-pro season. Listen, yeah. if I would have listened to half the stuff the coaches were telling me, I would have never went all-pro. All year, all I heard was, can you do this? It'll help the scheme. And I kept saying, no, all year. And look what happened. First team all-pro. First of all, <laughs> that was his quote. First of all, we all know he did not deserve all-pro that year. He didn't even make the Pro Bowl that year. Because he wasn't really that great. He had a lot of tackles. He had 140-some tackles. And why do you have 140-some tackles? He was playing middle linebacker in a scheme with no other linebackers at that time. Do you remember? All they had was Zadarius, who didn't play very much because he was hurt most of the year. Preston, Rashawn Gary, right? And they would just run to the quarterback, not try to tackle anybody, not cover anybody. And it was just him running around tackling everybody. Right? He wait. He'd stand there, wait till something, till a guy ran by him, and then he'd cackle him eight yards downfield. I mean, it was the the <laughs> AJ Hawk plan. Yeah, yeah. And somehow he made all all pro because he had 148 tackles, and the linebackers of that season must have been not as many tackles made, right? Um, there's one I more guess. tweet I got to get into where he talks about the scheme. Uh, where is it? I might have missed it. Might have been. <laughs> The last Here we go. So good. You, you, you're missing the part, right? Or you're not you're not missing it because you said it. But but they asked me, could I do this? Because it could help the scheme. Could oh yeah, we'll this? get into that. Uh, and I, yeah. okay. I'll get in. The, I'll let you take over with that one. I'm just trying to I'm trying to defend him here based on what he said. Okay. So here's the other thing. Here's the other tweet I want to get into. Because he says we ran a split safety system, which means we use our safeties a lot in the run fit. So if I shoot my gap before the safety triggers, we can get gashed. So most of the time, me and Quay were just trying to buy time for our safeties to get there. So you're telling me with two back safeties and one of them's Darnell Savage who can't tackle and the other one for a lot of time was was, uh, Owens who's okay, not great at tackling. And Agent Amos, who was slow to get there to make the tackle the season before, you're telling me you were told to wait until the safeties, who were 25 yards back, moved up into their spot before you, who was 8 to 10 yards back, could move toward the line of scrimmage to make a tackle. You had to wait until the safeties came all the way up from their back spot, even though you recognized there was a run, before you moved forward to make a play. That was the Joe Barry defense. Now, if these are what Devondre Campbell's saying, so if, if this is true, you can't blame Devondre Campbell. If Joe Barry's defense was to have Darnell Savage, who's the worst tackler safety in the football, to 
come in and make a tackle based on the run fits, and the linebackers have to wait until Darnell Savage comes up to the line of scrimmage before they can move to make a play. Then that's Joe Barry's system that's bad, right? It's not Devondre Campbell who's bad. It can't be. And the one year he said he made the All-Pro was the year where he did whatever he wanted, which was stand around and then go tackle a guy. But at least he went and tackled the guy then. He didn't listen to, he did, I guess, apparently, Joe Barry is a complete moron. I mean, that's what he's saying here. Joe Barry and Kirk Obelabagdali are morons. They told me to stand around, do nothing, <laughs> and let other guys try to do things, even though I'm the linebacker. Like, my job is to stop things that get through the first level of the defense. I have to go make a play. But apparently he says he had to wait until the safeties moved before he could move. And if that's the case, I defend Devondre Campbell. <laughs> Based on his tweets, it's not his fault. The safeties didn't move. So he can't move. It's not his fault. He's trying to be a team guy. Right? He's trying to follow what his coaches are telling him, who don't watch the film, he admits. And he also admits when he didn't listen to the coaches, he was an all pro. So why would you listen to the coaches if you think they're dumb? Do what you did the first year and try to make plays and try to do things. <laughs> but to be a good guy, Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee this year, should have never been, should have been Aaron Jones a fourth year in a row. That's besides the point. Good guy. Uh, and as far as I know, Devondre Campbell is a guy, good guy. Seems like a pretty good guy. Well, we think, unless until the Apparently heat gets... He's, the, he's as dumb as Joe Barry if he listened to these coaches who told him to do nothing. Stay eight yards back, look at the quarterback. Don't pay attention to anybody who comes in your vicinity. Um, don't move until the ball moves. Then try to go make a tackle. And that's how we had 142 tackles. That's what we did his first year with us. The second, third years, he didn't even move to try to make a tackle. Until it was too late, then he missed tackles. So with all these things said, that's my defense. I defend Devondre Campbell. It's not his fault that he sucked terribly bad for the last two years. His coaching, his coaches told him to do nothing. His coaches told him, you can't move until the safety moves. You can't look at any receivers that come in your vicinity or tight ends or running backs. <laughs> you must always watch the quarterback and follow the ball. Even and when then it's a, first move. Even when it's a running play, always watch the quarterback. Is that what he was doing too? I don't know. Based on his tweets, all, all the things I just said, that's my defense, Packer fans, for Devondre Campbell. Apparently, he's dumb, really dumb. He's also saying Quay Walker's dumb because he said that Quay Walker looked like uh, he didn't know what he's doing out there either. But that's my defense. Devondre Campbell's not his fault. It's everybody else's fault. Everybody else's fault. And I just want you to think mm. about that for a second. I mm. think there was another Packer who was on the team for, I don't know, 15, 18 years. He was a starter for like 15 or 16 years. And I think <laughs> it was the same thing with him. Wasn't it? Same? Like It was always somebody else's fault. The wind was bad. Uh, he had a bug in his eye. Um, he did have his receivers, couldn't catch. It was always the defense was bad. That's why they couldn't win. It was never Aaron Rodgers' fault. This is very Aaron Rodgers-like. Not his fault. Everybody else's fault. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, based on his tweets, that's my defense. I rest my case. Devondre Campbell, you're dumb, but I can't be upset with you because apparently you follow what the coaches told you, who were dumb and didn't watch film, but you still <laughs> did what they said. And now, of course, you got cut. Your turn. Well, <laughs> Thundercats12 tweeted back at him, said, Come on, dude. We loved you here and that you were part of the team, but why trash the Packers after you made 23 mil an all pro? And Devondre comes back, tweets back, why y'all keep saying I trash the Packers? I never once said anything negative about the organization. Best organization I've ever been a part of at this point. Well, he's only been a part of a couple of like Atlanta and the Packers, right? But okay, whatever. But and the it's Cardinals. Some, the Cardinals for oh, one year. Oh, yeah. But it's some coaches I lost all respect for. So, you know, this is classic stuff. It's not never my fault. Then when somebody calls you out a little bit for some of your crap, then you're like, what? 
What are you guys talking about? I didn't say that. I didn't say anything bad about this and this. And I just twisted around. Like, I think, I don't know. Look, man, we have, first of all, how many times did we watch plays? Did you watch games? Did you see? We went back and film review, rewatch plays. There's no defense for what he's what he did on a bunch of those plays. He, whether his shoulder was hurt, whether I don't care. That doesn't affect what, how you how you read the play and move with the play and move your legs and pursue and try to tackle people. There was none of that. There was a lot of standing around, like you said. It's That's not how anybody can play linebacker. And if the coaches wanted him to keep his eyes more on the quarterback, that's just on passing downs. That doesn't excuse whatsoever his play on running downs. And lastly... As he goes back to, you know, one one of the tweets you had where he's like, I wasn't up pressing guys and blah, blah, blah. I, he didn't do that crap anytime. I didn't see him do that the other years either, where he's up on guys very often. Maybe once in a while in man, but not very often. So he paints some very different picture than what was reality, which is what people usually do when they don't like reality. And the guys just bitter and sour and dead wrong and you got paid when you shouldn't have got paid you got a bunch of money from this dumbass gm because he thought he had nothing else didn't know what else to do so we gave you a big contract got out of it after a couple of years take your 20 some million bucks and just move on dude you know get over it dumb well there's a couple other things that are key here that i want to get into his tweet from december when he said i don't want to play anymore when I'm not, when I'm hurt or whatever Wait, the case. Why is wondering? Why is wondering? Did the coaches tell him to get bulldozed by running backs? Yeah, apparently, they told him <laughs> to stand there, do nothing. No, that part we can't defend. Why? That part we can't defend. <laughs> but he said he's not going to play 100 percent unless he's feeling 100 percent in December. What player is feeling 100 percent in December? Nobody. Honest to God, nobody. nobody. Like that's a freaking ridiculous. Oh wait, except ex- except Jair because he sits out. Unless well, he's well Aaron, Unless Jones, he's Aaron Jones was 100 percent in December, and he looked awesome oh, yeah. <laughs> for the last five games. The other thing that's really important here is when asked about the Joe Barry defense and why it sucks so bad, and how come you had well, how did the turnaround happen? You know, it seemed like you guys played pretty good at the end of the year. And he said he went and talked. Here's what he said: uh, because I started going and having private meetings with Matt Lafleur here, telling him we needed to be more aggressive. We needed more man, and we needed to blitz more. And what happened? When they listened to me, we played well and won. It's no coincidence. <laughs> so he's now saying, yeah, that's his tweet. He's saying that because he told Matt LaFleur, even though every fan with two eyes and every show on this show, Pack, Pack a Day podcast, <laughs> P- Peter Bukowski, you can name them all. Every, there's like 100 freaking Packer shows. Every one of them talked about how there's too passive, need to be aggressive, need to try to do something to dictate the terms to the offense. But it was Devondre Campbell who got through to Matt LaFleur to tell Joe Barry to change it a little bit, which he did do a little bit of changing. But the other key part about this is this. Remember, Campbell was hurt, said he wasn't going to play no more. After they lost to Tampa, they didn't lose again. And Devondre Campbell didn't play again until the playoffs when they lost. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's there's no coincidence for that either, Devondre. Is there? The team, the defense was much better when you weren't out there, and that's why I, I love William G. He's the man. But he's saying they should have given Campbell a chance to play at least one season with the new defense coordinator. I disagree. He's he's 100%. he's over thirty. Um, the thing that bothers me the most is the fact that, well, there's two things. The one thing is he said he didn't want to play these hundred percent, and the other thing was he said that his first year he just did whatever he wanted, didn't listen to his coaches. This guy was one of the oldest players on the team. I don't think he was a leader. I don't know. I guess he was. He didn't seem to be talked very much. But if you're talking like that and you're trashing guys, I think it's kind of the same thing with the Aaron Rodgers thing. When we're getting a whole new coaching staff, right? Let's have young players who could be molded by this new coaching staff. I think the new linebacking co- linebacker coach is way fired, more fired up. I think he's way better than Kurt Obladogli or whatever his name is. Jeff Halfley is a thousand times better than Joe Barry. Actually knows what he's talking about. I don't know how many times we watch a Joe Barry press conference after the game, why they got their butts kicked, and he's like, well, I don't know. 
Oh, I, don't, I don't know what happened. I, I don't know how to. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't know. Well, I think if I knew that, the then... coordinator, if you don't know the answer, right? <laughs> but so th- that's another reason why I defend Devondre Campbell a little bit. Is yeah, the defensive coaches were dumb, and we said it for a while now. I, I never liked Kurt Ogle Benogly, and he's been here for five years, and the linebackers have stunk for five years. All right, hold on one second here. I'm going to say this. Devondre right, Campbell talking about being more aggressive is also very ironic. He is one of the most passive linebackers I've ever seen. He is AJ. He is like AJ Hawk. Like he's for, he's he's a dark AJ Hawk. All right. He's a black guy who plays like AJ Hawk. AJ Hawk was a white guy who played like AJ Hawk. Either way, he's basically AJ Hawk again, except. AJ Hawk didn't trash the team and say a bunch of crap when he left and whined like a baby. AJ Hawk knew he wasn't that good, was lucky to be on the Packers as long as he was, as lucky to win a Super Bowl, and he took it and was like, okay, fine. Devondre Campbell, look, physically, when you look at him, long arms, he's got good speed, decent size for an inside backer. Like, physically, the stuff is there. Like, he should be good. He should be good. But one of the reasons why he was never that good is because he's not aggressive because he doesn't diagnose an attack. He sits back, waits, and then reacts late. But his coach and, told him to sit back and wait and do nothing. Uh, come on. Based man. on his and, tweets. And and David says Campbell's too slow. He probably has slowed down a little bit, but it's not even that. It's it's the, the start here. Isaiah McDuffie is slow. He's not fast. But he was in the backfield making tackles because he diagnosed a play and attack. That was the difference. Campbell, so that's the other part that doesn't make sense. When when McDuffie was in there, you saw a very different linebacker play. Was that that was because they all of a sudden changed the way they were what they were telling the linebackers to do? That also doesn't make sense. It's one guy who plays aggressive and attacks and wants to tackle people, another guy who can't diagnose stuff or just decides he's gonna wait. That's it. That's the difference. Okay. I think you said the key thing right there, Jason, is that when McDuffie's out there, he's three inches shorter, probably point, you know, two tenths of a second slower in the 40 yard dash, weighs less, probably has a whole three inches to to four or five inches shorter in arm length, yet still made way more plays this year. And it's because he read, he did the defense correctly. If you're going to sit back eight yards off, you keep things in front of you. When a guy flashes out of your, out of your eye, like you keep your eyes on the quarterback, but you have to flash. If the, if the route comes flashing into your space, you attack that sky, right? Now you're the cover guy for that guy, and you stick with him while he's in your space. And you move to the ball. If you see a tight end swerting out into the side, you attack that tight end. And you tackle him for a no gain or a loss, which is what McDuffie did a couple times. Him, Keyshawn Nixon, Rudy Ford, those are the guys who who would attack plays to the outside of the field. You watch them screaming down and attack, right? The difference is Savage, Campbell, Jair, they all stand there, wait for the guy to catch it, even though they're right there in front of him instead of attacking the ball, and then first try to tackle him, and then none of them are good tacklers. So the guy gets through and makes a big play, right? So there's no pass breakups. There's no, you know, tackle immediately to stop the guy from getting more yardage. And, and there's no recognizing what's going on out there. And there's no disrupting of, of receivers' routes. Th- that's the biggest problem. If you're going to play that sit-back defense, you have to attack when the ball is in the air. You have to attack when you see the flash of the guy coming into your area. If you stand there and do nothing, it's pretty much letting the offense go play on air, right? It's, it's almost like doing a seven-on-seven drill. Like, there's nobody there to stop you. They just run their route. It's fine. Quarterback throws an easy pass. And then you go to go to make a tackle. It's dumb. And I guarantee the coaches didn't tell them to sit back eight yards and then do nothing and wait and just look at the quarterback and not do anything. The bottom line is he does not, he can't play that defense. He can't recognize what he's supposed to do. He's not, he can't learn the coaching. He said he did, he only knew 50% of the defense is his uh, first year with the team. Because he didn't show up until mini, the end of minicamp or whatever. 
And he was in there out there playing. And he was just running around doing stuff. He didn't know what the heck was going on. Or only only have to. And then he just did whatever. Right. And then he made all pro. <laughs> but that's the thing is, I think Devondre Campbell, if they played him as a line and he, if his, he had an assignment, like cover the tight end, he'd still be bad, but he'd be better than what he was the last couple of years where he was playing the zone and react, read and react type thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And and that's one of the things that I would say is like, he probably could be a good player. Like now he's going to this, to the 49ers. He just got sided with the 49ers. I'm assuming to replace Dre Greenlaw until he can, <laughs> until Greenlaw can come back from his injury. Jeez. The difference between Dre Greenlaw and Devondre Campbell is night and day. They're going to find out real quick because Dre Greenlaw reads, reacts, attacks, goes. He does not hesitate for a second. And the one time he did hesitate, he tried to go on the field, realized it was too soon, went backwards, and then tried to go back on the field again and hurt himself in the playoff game, right? With the Super Bowl. Wasn't that Super Bowl when he hurt himself on, on like just trying to go out, walk onto the field? Poor Dre Greenlaw. That guy's awesome. I would love him to be a peck. Mm. But anyways, Mondre Campbell is not going to be anything like Dre Greenlaw out there at linebacker. No. Four Niners better realize it. <clears throat> oh, they're, um, it's going to be too late for them. But uh, anyways, so that's, that's all I'm going to say is, is, is these are the situations and – it's it's like he just doesn't he can't read and react. So the the bigger question I have for you, Jace, is this: Can Quay Walker succeed in the Jeff Halfley defense? Do do you think from watching plays was he able to react a little bit better? He seemed to be a little bit better, but he definitely wasn't like McDuffie. He doesn't have like the awareness that those guys have. He seems to be better when he is told the job and he does the job. Right. So I, I guess I don't know much about playing linebacker that, that I mean, way. Quay Walker has at least shown a little more instincts and a little more he diagnosis and at least tries to run to, I think, holes at times. But I mean, by far, McDuffie is their most instinctive linebacker who recognizes, sees it and goes, you know, by far. And that guy was a six round pick who's undersized and not that fast. Right. Quay Walker. Uh, I mean, I think they're going to plan to do a lot of stuff with him, but he's probably better if they give him an attack assignment versus reading, you know, a read assignment and just be like, Hey, go for it. Like blow up this hole and tackle anything that you see. You know, if it's the running back, it's a handoff, go get him. If it's a quarterback, go get him. Like if, if Halfley wants to do stuff like that with Quay Walker, I think that would be good. It'll definitely put pressure on the other team. You might, you know, you might give up some bigger runs behind it if he misses or whatever. Or there could be a guy running over in the middle that they get the ball off to um, on a pass play. But, I mean, that's what you got safeties for. So I think um, he's probably more successful with that. I think Campbell's not successful no matter what you do. And good riddance. Take all your baggage with you and you're whining and complaining. Um, hey, Darnell Savage is a, a Jaguar signed by the Jaguars. Wow, that'll be another guy they'll uh, they'll wake up to and be like, "What the hell did we sign him for?" <laughs> okay, um, let's talk about a couple other things here. David's here, uh, William G here, Wyatt, Dad, a couple others hanging out. But there were a few other things we wanted to get to tonight, Ben. And our good friend Bill Huber wrote an article the other day. Now some of these guys have been signed, so we'll stick to the ones that we know. But Bill Huber was going through it. He's like. Bargain, basement, free agents, the Packers should explore. And I'm I'm going to say they should just sign most of these guys. I don't know what they're doing. So um, Eric Wilson, number one. Not number one, but he's one of them. Eric Wilson, linebacker. They need linebackers. He's been yeah. on the team. He's knows the defense a little bit. So they be- definitely should sign Eric Wilson back. Seems like a no-brainer. Well, just his special teams, his leadership there. He's been in the league for a long time. I mean, he that awesome fumble recovery uh, in the playoff game where Keyshawn Dixon had a good return and then fumbled, and, and Wilson didn't give up on the play. He David bakhtiari did it, where he ran all the way down there, except he actually did something when he was down there instead of just doing nothing the whole time. So that's great. I'm, I'm on fire today. I'm, ready to, I'm just cutting everybody down here. But anyways, but Wilson, that's, he's a guy I said he should bring back. Of the free agents I said, the guys you should bring back, Rudy Ford, Eric Wilson, I don't know. That's Rudy Ford. It. Rudy Ford's on Bill Huber's list too. And I think that's no, Rudy Ford's no awesome. Brainer. 
Rudy Ford is another one of guys. He's a he's a special teams guy. He's a good tackler. Uh, I like what what Bill Huber says to him here, or about him here. You know, they this is after they'd already signed McKinney. Okay, which hopefully he's going to be good. Hopefully you he's know, a difference maker. Yeah, Goody likes Goody likes guys who went to big successful programs in college. Yeah. So now you got two Alabama guys in free agency. You get a bunch of money too. Hopefully they pan out. And three Georgia um, guys. <laughs> I I like him. I mean, I like McKinney. I like Josh Jacobs. I hope they do well. Well, I did see when you watch some highlight films of McKinney, there was. There's a couple of plays that look like Rasul Douglas mm-hmm. where he reads the ball in the air on like an outside, like one of those wide receiver screens mm-hmm. and attacks it and then just picks it off and goes, you know, takes it back for a touch, like for a touchdown. Like he, he, he's, he reminds me of Rasul, but not, but he's playing safety, which is what we've all said is we would love to see Rasul Douglas playing safety because a guy who's that aware and can has that many, he has better, Rasul has better ball skills than this guy has. Um, yeah. but McKinney's a little bit quicker and a little bit longer, I think. Well, maybe not longer, but I think he's just a little bit quicker than Rasul is. But I th- he seems to have pretty good awareness. So, okay, go back to Rudy Ford. I mean, Sewell's got great ball skills, so you'd love Amazing him. ball skills. There's yeah, not he- anybody that's as good as him. But he points out Rudy Ford's got a speed and a yep. nose for the ball, and he does. He's got five interceptions in part-time play over the last two seasons, okay? Tied with your all-world quarterback, Jair Alexander, Um who only had those interceptions in one season, by the way, but it was only his season where he only had interceptions. Well, that's neither here nor there. Rudy Ford, who the Packers are ready to cast aside at a position that they don't have any depth. They need to get him. He's a quality tackler, a proven special teamer. Um, he says, take PFF grades for what they're worth. Credit to Bill Huber for this information. He was Green Bay's fourth ranked defender each of the last two years. Mm-hmm. Of the whole defense. And, and that's consistent with what we've said on the show mm-hmm. from looking at the film. We've said, I don't know why Rudy, why is there? And, but all I've heard is people complain about Rudy Ford and say he stinks. Even Andy Herman is, talks crap about Rudy Ford. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He makes plays. He attacks. He gave up one play one time where he read the wrong thing. And they sat him down and put Savage back in where Savage gives up plays like five times a game. It should have been sav- sat down a hundred times. Rudy Ford single-handedly won us the game against Dallas, him and Christian Watson, last year, two, two seasons ago when he picked off stupid, uh, what's his face, Dak Prescott twice. Because Rudy Ford's the monster. <laughs> We've been saying that for this whole time. And Rudy Ford and McKinney could be a really good combo. Yeah. Because Rudy can come down around the box. He could stay back. He's got the speed to cover back there. And... He's got the ball skills to catch the ball if it goes back there. And McKinney seems to be an all-around guy where he could play down around the box if he needs to or go back and play deep safety. Or if they do a two-safety two shell, both those guys together back there could really make a play and get to the ball. And Rudy Ford would be a cheap guy to do it. Hmm. And though Anthony Johnson Jr., maybe he could do it too. I don't know. He might be able to do it, but that's, you know, I don't know. I just think Rudy Ford is a good depth piece for special teams, for our safety room that we're obviously, we're not having Owens, we're not having Savage. So this is a guy we can bring in, and I heard I've heard a lot of things about the safety class in the draft. There's like a couple guys that are pretty good, but they're both kind of slower. There's a guy from Minnesota everybody likes, and there's another guy who's pretty good. But other than that, it's like eh, nothing much. So are you willing to waste the first or second round pick on a safety? Goody will never do that. So bring back Rudy Ford. He did on Savage, but um, ironically as well. The Jaguars were the ones that cast aside Rudy Ford for the Packers. Got him a couple years ago, <laughs> and they just signed Darnell Savage. So <laughs> the Jaguars it, are dumb. We all we, it's not <laughs> surprising. Definitely not good at evaluating safeties. Okay, more on Bill Huber's list, and you know this next name got me pretty excited, and it's something you threw out there in the off season as like just a wish list thing. But based on how the Packers have evolved, John Runyon's gone. Um. They don't have a lot of interior guys for backups. They've had some injuries with Jenkins and what have you. And Josh Myers, we all know he could get injured at any second or maybe just not get up off the field. You never know. Is Lucas Patrick's contract with the Bears, where he finally got paid some money, two years, eight million bucks total, four million a year, all guaranteed. So he actually got the money. So that's good. Um, is up. And the Bears aren't signing him back because they're done with them. So do the Packers for depth, for uh having a good leader that they sorely lack leadership on both sides of the ball, 
having a guy who could back up center and probably would have to start some games at center. Do they pick up my guy, Lucas Patrick and bring him back to the team? Well, we all know, I think Lucas is a good player. I think he's a good veteran. The thing I love the most about Lucas was he's always looking for work. That's my favorite part about Lucas Patrick. Even if he misses his initial block, he's still looking to get somebody else, which with Aaron Jones as your running back led to some bigger runs because, yeah, maybe his guy got through, but then Jones made that guy miss, and then he gets downfield a little bit, and then there's Lukey blocking a different guy, and then Aaron Jones can go for a little bit longer, right? The only thing that concerns me about Lucas is he's been injured a lot the last two years under that Bears contract. And that's kind of scary. He wasn't hurt last year. He wasn't? No. He just had two he had two injuries his first year. He got injured in training camp. He broke his toe, I want to say. Stupid thing, right? Break your toe in training camp. And then no, no, he broke his hand. He broke his right hand. He broke his hand, yeah. Yeah, he broke his hand in like the second practice. So I couldn't play center. To, he was supposed to be their starting center. Then he came back and played with a club uh, for a while to start the season playing guard. And then he broke his toe. And then he was out most of the first season. Last season, listen to this. Last season, he was 14th among all interior blockers in pass blocking win rate, which is ahead of Elton Jenkins and John Runyon Jr., by the way. Um, he also led the team with Justin Fields playing quarterback sometimes, but also that Tyler Bagent guy or whatever. Yep. Like he pumped him up and taught and made all the line calls and helped him out. And you know that the Bears are, and the other thing, and I'll just say this: I didn't watch a lot of Bears games, but the ones I watched, we all remember because we we saw the Packers dominate the Bears for years and years and years, right? The Bears. Played offensive linemen, a bunch of passive guys who would like barely do anything and then give up on the play and stand around like a lot of offensive linemen do. Like Rasheed Walker does. Last season, (laughs) last season, you saw guys on the Bears for the first time in, in my memory, their offensive linemen were finishing blocks, were playing to the whistle, were playing with some grit and toughness. And the main thing that was different was that Lucas was there on the field leading that group of offensive linemen. So, I mean, even just as a tone setter, as a guy who knows what's going on, even if you don't think he can play anymore, which I still think he can because the numbers will show you he can. And you're probably going to need somebody to step in for Myers at some point during the year. And he can back up multiple positions inside. Even if you don't want to start him, he can still be a veteran voice that can be a leader. I mean, I think it's a pretty much a no-brainer. You probably offer him chump change because that's what the Packers would do with him. But if he took it, he'd probably come back. Uh, I really hope they do. Then my jersey can come back out and be relevant again. That would be a nice little infusion of Packer fandom enthousi- enthusiasm for me, for sure, if that happened. Well, I mean, he's immediately the sixth best offensive lineman at that, or maybe fifth, fourth best. Actually, probably third best. No, fourth best. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe third best. But he, he'd be better than a lot of other guys just by signing them. Now, I don't know who they would draft. Maybe they draft a first-round pick who's supposed to be awesome. Who knows? But, I mean, he's more reliable than Myers, Sean Ryan at this point. We don't know what he is. Um, Rasheed Walker, he played pretty good at the end of the year, but we also saw him do a lot of big dog stuff. And by big dog, I mean Glenn Robinson from the Bucks and the – 90s where he works really hard then as soon as the whistle blew big dog would be all slumped down and he's done right like you you you, Rasheed Walker would block for first two seconds and then he's done Luki Patrick the opposite like block 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 whistle blows shove the guy in the ground that's Luki Patrick that's why you love Luki Patrick that's why you know Larry McCarron had his you got Lucas because Lucas would just shove guys until the whistle and then shove them on the ground and overpower them. And it was awesome. Right. Plus he's a great team guy. Great community guy. Like awesome guy all the way around. So another, another guy from the bears are talking about is Cody Whitehair is a free agent. So if you want some depth on the inside, he's a pretty good player. I'd rather take Luke Patrick. Bill Huber points out Derek Barnett. And I was a little confused here. He better not be a a relative of Nick Barnett. Derek Barnett as a, an edge guy for D end. I don't know much about him. First round pick by the Eagles in 2017. He'll turn 28 in June. No. Um, he's, he always only had 24 career sacks, but he's got, uh, 
he had six games. Uh, he, he, he led the team in uh, lost tackles for a loss with the Texans uh, last season. So I don't know. But again, the they new, got they got Preston, they got Van Ness, they got Gary, they got yeah, they don't need it because they're fine. Like it, these people that think the Packers need defensive linemen is is it's no, they don't. They, need, they already have they, too many guys. Like they, they like need they're going from linebackers. They're going from a five down lineman to four down lineman. Like mm-hmm. if for some reason they need needed more mm-hmm. depth at defensive end, Carl Brooks and Colby Wooden can easily move to defensive end and if if if, if need be. And Jonathan Ford can step up as a big fat D tackle, or they draft a guy who's a D tackle. Like they do, a D tackle. I'd, I'd like to see more D tackle help. Sure, because we'll get into that in a little bit. But, but as far as a defensive end, an old like a twenty eight year old defensive end off the street, nah, no, we don't need him. All right, David's talking about first. I, when I first glanced at this, I thought it said Pork Chop Robinson. Well, that's his, and his nickname is Pork Chop. Is it Pork but Chop? He, but he likes to go by Chop. Oh, okay. Pork pick chop Robinson. Okay, from Penn State. Okay, okay. And he's outside he's the defensive end outside linebacker yeah. pass rusher guy, which and, and he's awesome. He's kind of like he reminds me of Colby uh no um a Carl Brooks. Oh, okay. Where he just kind of yeah. like always he's just always making plays. He's always back nice. there messing stuff up. He's not like the fastest guy or anything like that. He's just awesome. Kind of awesome like guy. Enigbari then. So like Enigbari. No, Carl he's Brooks. more no, he's not he he's better than Enigbari. Oh, okay. Well, He's more enough. Carl Brooks. All right. Uh, Bill Huber brings up a couple interesting ones as well. Zach Cunningham, second round pick in twenty. No, no, you don't want him. Okay. Listen, I watched. Remember, I one of the first times we when we when I started doing film it was three four years ago when Zach Cunningham was on the on the Houston Texans. Yep. I watched film on him, and he he looks like Devondre Campbell out there. Ooh, Actually, he's the that. opposite. He would go to the wrong. He, he would just do the wrong read. Oh, he so he's like that. Him. He's like that dude that we drafted from Minnesota, what five six years ago. Yeah, just he would constantly the- take himself out of the play by going to the wrong read, over and over again, on the film. Now maybe in his age, he's gotten better, possibly. And he's super. He's supposed to be fast and crazy and whatever, but I don't know. I mean, I guess we have a really huge hole linebacker, so it wouldn't hurt. That's one where I'd be okay with. <laughs> Here's another one that's uh, athletic freak, high pick, Isaiah Simmons. Yeah, he and him I like. Hmm. Just because, like, we we talk about this all the time. We talked about Jeremy Chin. He's already signed with somebody now. Yep. We talked about when Josh Jones was on the team. These guys who are big and fast and they're kind of tweeners between a linebacker safety you know, kind of like Crawford was last year or two, two years ago. And they didn't know what to do with him, except he didn't, you know, he had no instincts and didn't know what he was doing. Isaiah Simmons is that guy. He's a freak of nature. He can rush the, he can do anything from rush the passer to run around and make tackles and cover guys and do all kinds of stuff. But he doesn't have that innate awareness, right? But he is aggressive. So it's the opposite of McDuffie as far as like knowing where things are and being able to move and, and, and go. And I don't think he's a safety. He's certainly not a free safety, but he could certainly be a um, in the box safety or like a weak side linebacker or something like that who can adjust and blitz at times and get to the quarterback because he's fast and he's big enough to get it back there and then also do something to the quarterback and hit him and do some things. So he'd be a good signing. Since we didn't get Jeremy Chen, this could be a good signing. Probably get him super cheap because it hasn't worked out for him. You know, when, when when the Cardinals drafted him, he was like really high pick, like a top ten, and yeah. people were like, "Oh, they were all excited! Like he's a weapon, he's a weapon." Except nobody, it never worked. Like nobody ever knew what to do with him. And well, it, and it, it could be the hit, it could be the player, right? But could be. But listen, take a to shot this. for a one year cheapy contract, it could be worth it. Prove it, yeah, prove it, deal. I mean, so in twenty twenty, when he was drafted. He had 105 tackles, seven passes defended, four forced fumbles. In 21, he had 99 tackles, four sacks, seven passes defended. Wait a minute. He had four forced fumbles in one season. Yeah. I don't think the Packers have had a four forced fumbles in one season, the entire defense in like yeah. forever. Like they don't, for, we don't force fumbles. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The 105 tackles, seven passes defended, four forced fumbles were in 2021. 
99 tackles, four sacks, seven passes defended in 2022. Uh, seven passes defended, by the way, in back-to-back seasons. That's We have cornerbacks that Who barely get that, that yeah. many. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, the, but so that was the situation. Then he got traded to the Giants for a seventh round pick. For a seventh round pick. So it drafted That's in the even worse round. than Justin Fields. <laughs> I mean, it's bad. It's bad. So, but here's the, here's the thing. Super high on him coming out in the draft. Really high first round pick. Put up some impressive numbers a couple of years. Was not in a bad, dysfunctional, whacked out organization, which we know firsthand from Asul Douglas talking about what it was like there. Then so far down, he comes so far down, he gets traded to the garbage Giants team for a seventh round pick, has a down season, only four starts. And so maybe it's a reset. Maybe it's you have an incredibly athletic guy who's been, you know, got drafted really high, all these expectations flying high, brought way down here. He's he's going to go one of two directions, right? He's going to go down and be out, or he's going to claw himself back up and reach what you thought he could be, and maybe that's to the Packers' benefit if they give him that chance this year. So that's why I like it, too. Go for well, it. That's a key piece, too, is when, when to guys win. come to the Packers, they talk about it all the time. It's like there's only the only thing to do here is football. Right. And maybe that's right. what Isaiah Simmons meet, needs is a place to go where all he can do is football. There's nothing else to do in Green Bay. So he has no choice but to study football and get better to be quite honest. And it's kind of like a Charles Woodson thing. I mean, I'm not saying he's as good as Charles Woodson, but Charles Woodson was kind of floundering with the Raiders. He, he was great at first. He made some plays, kind of was disgruntled. They gave up on him. Nobody wanted to sign him. The Packers gave him money to come here. He, he didn't want to do work. And then finally, you know, him and Mike McCarthy got in a big fight. And then he's like, fine, I'll work hard. And then he was awesome, right? Yeah. I'm not saying this guy is as good as Charles Woodson. He's not. He doesn't have the... You know, just awareness. Woodson was just new stuff. Like it was almost like he was psychic. He knew where the ball was going to go. And like, if you ever have time, go watch some Charles Woodson highlights on YouTube. It's great. Like I forget some of the stuff he did. Like like that one time where he just dove over the top of the whole defensive line to tackle the guy <laughs> in the backfield. Like as one freaking fourth down play or something, and he caused a fumble. It was like he just did insane, awesome crap. Right? Like I, I miss that. I miss a guy like that on defense <laughs> who just would just do he, stuff. And he attacked too. Oh, he? he was awesome. He was awesome. Um, and it worked great because w- along with him was Tremont, who was a great cover guy. Yep. And and Sam Shields, who was super fast. So even if he wasn't a great cover guy, he could make up for it by being super fast. And then that allowed, because those two guys could play outside corner, it allowed Charles to just do whatever he wanted. He was like the slot star guy. He could do what you know, line up over the wide receiver. And if he read that he thought it was a run, he would attack it and just destroy it. Or, or he could still cover, or he could get picks, or he could do all kinds of crazy stuff. And he was that key piece that worked. And then what happened was after he was gone, the Packers put Micah Hyde in that spot and Micah Hyde was no Charles Woodson. He didn't have the speed and the athletic ability, but he had the knowledge and he was able to do some similar things, jumping routes and get picks and stuff. He didn't do all the crazy stuff Charles Woodson did, but he was smart and did a lot of great stuff. And then the bills of course signed him and moved him to safety where he had all pro seasons and pro bowl seasons over there. And now he's a free agent. That'd be, that'd be a pretty cool signing as well. But Micah's injury history and his age, Kind of, I don't know if he's worth signing for that for as as a player. We'll see, but he's he's an awesome guy. Well, he would be a great leader guy too for a young young group on defense, and maybe a guy you know he could certainly pass along some good information to young safeties and stuff, and young corners. But for Simmons, the other thing I wanted to point out is, hey, you got this, you got this young, excitable, you know, fired up new linebacker coach. In here too, so it can make a big difference. I mean, Rasul Douglas talked about the you know a big thing that that worked for him and that helped him kind of get to where he did with the Packers was his coach, his new coach, right? And so that can make a difference too. So I think 100 percent on that. Take a swing. You got to take some swings, and this guy is worth taking a swing at, and it's probably not even going to cost you very much. So yeah, go ahead and do it. And I would love to have Micah Hyde back. So, I mean, if the Packers find a way and don't be dumb and sign back some of these really good guys, um, you could fill leadership roles with veteran guys who also can, you know, understand that that they're going to be part of their role is going to be like preparing 
sharing their knowledge, their expertise with some of these younger players to help them come along faster. And they'll embrace that stuff for sure. Like these are the type of good guys that'll embrace that role and not going to be like poo poo and, you know, helping out the young guys. So I would love it. Um, all right. Let's see. David brings up this one, Ben, which I think we've talked about, but you can address it. Says, uh, I don't think we need any other wide receivers. What do y'all think? I 100% agree with you, David. And to be quite honest, I'm sick of looking at Twitter, well, X or whatever, and Facebook and other weird things and hearing, seeing the, oh, T. Higgins, trade for T. Higgins. Oh, do we got to trade for T. Higgins, everybody? Oh, do we got to get a receiver in the draft? And we got to get a, we got to get a, no. T. Higgins is not even, if we traded for T. Higgins, he would be the fifth receiver on the team. I'm telling you right now, I would rather have Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, uh, Reed, and Wicks out there. Heck, he'd be six. I'd rather have Bo Melton out there. He'd be seven. I'd rather have Lee Heath out there than T. Higgins. T. Higgins is not that great. He has suspect hands. He's not fast. He's tall. Doesn't run great routes. When Jamar Chase isn't out there, he's not the same guy because then he's the number one and he's not good. So stop it. The only way you get a receiver is if somehow he is better than our six guys. Like you have to draft if you're if you're to sign a receiver or or draft a receiver, he has to be better than all the receivers we have now. Because it makes no sense. Because right now we have all those guys are very, very good. They're all very good. And they all have distinct roles. You know, Bo Melton's our speedster. He goes deep. Um, Malik Heath is blocker, tough guy, catches in, you know, good catches in the, you know, turnaround, comeback route, stuff like that. Latavian Wicks, I think, is the best of the bunch, to be quite honest. He's got the best route running, great hands, great run after the catch, awesome burst from the initial catch, way better than Devontae Adams ever had. He's Devontae Adams with quick quickness. Awesome. That's great. Jaden Reed is Randall Cobb with speed. Awesome. That's already that's that's better than guys we've had that were second round picks. And these guys were okay. Jaden Reed's third round pick. Wicks is a fifth round pick. You know, and then Romeo Dobbs is he's okay. He's solid. <laughs> he's he's the fourth one. He's the fourth receiver on the team right now. <laughs> yeah. And then Christian Watson is has the potential to be amazing. But he still doesn't have body control. Like Randy, like he's got the size of Randy Moss, but he doesn't have the body control of Randy Moss. And he doesn't have the hands of Randy Moss. Yeah. So in essence, he's MVS with a little bit better run after the catch. Right? That and he's a little bit bigger. Like side like muscle wise. Yeah. Yeah. But he's not he's he's you know, if you can so if you can find a guy who can do all those things into one, then you draft him, right? Mm-hmm. But if you can't find somebody who can do, who has the size, the speed, the hands, the agility, and the blocking, don't waste it. You've got all of that with these guys. Mm -hmm. If you need the block, okay, put Malik Heath, Dontavian Wicks out there. Those two guys are great blockers. Then you can fake it, do some play action, and boom, get the ball those guys downfield. You want to take a, you got, let's say you played against a team that has really slow corners. Okay, Bo Melton, Christian Watson, you guys are out there. And then we also have to talk about. Musgrave and Kraft and Ben Sims, who are all big, awesome, fast tight ends who have different skills. Tucker Kraft, great after the catch. And all young. And all young. And all, and all young and all cheap. They're all cheap. So, I couldn't agree more with you, David. We don't need any receivers. We don't need any tight ends. We don't need a quarterback. Jordan Love is doing pretty good. We can be honest. And I think, that, and I also like freaking uh, birthday buddy. We got Sean Clifford. So, I mean, all we need an offense. We don't. We don't need a running back anymore because we just signed a bunch, signed one, and brought a guy back, and we got freaking Emmanuel Wilson on the bench. So we don't need a running back either. So all these eleven draft picks we can use on offensive line, safety, inside linebacker, defensive tackle, corner. Those are the spots we need. Corner especially because our corners stink, or they're crazy, or whatever. But I agree. No receivers, please. We're, we're good. <laughs> We've been drafting corners and defensive backs forever, and we still just can't get it right. See, and oh that's God. that's the thing I don't get. Like that's <laughs> I can see a good use of money there. 
Like if there's a corner out there and free agency was good. It was actually good and a proven guy. Yeah. And a good tackle. Wait, wait, we had it. Wait. Oh, wait, that's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. We traded him. (laughs) But anyways, so. For nothing to move up 40 spots or whatever it was. (laughs) Just stupid. Uh, so those are i i was looking at a mock draft okay that i was looking at a mock draft that had the packers getting max melton so in the second round maybe he can play third round third round that'd be even better if they give him third round maybe he's a guy that could step in and be that corner that they want i don't know i would like it i would love to see it the one thing I would say is I don't want I don't think Goody's track record with first round corners or even second round corners is that great. I don't think he should do it. If you're going to spend oh, a first they, round pick missed, or a second round pick, I would rather I've said a million, bunch of them. Right. I said this a million times. I would rather get the best guard or the best center or the best safety or the best linebacker in the draft at the late first round pick or the, or the jet second round pick high second round pick, then get the seventh best offensive tackle or the eighth best corner. It doesn't make sense. Like you can get a guy who's going to be a pro bowl guard, or you can get a guy who's going to be an okay. Who's the eighth corner in his class. Not even a pro. Like he has no chance of being a pro bowl player at his position. I don't care if it's a premium position. Look at what the Lions did last year. We talked about it. We loved their draft. Why? They attacked running back because they needed it. Second best running back in the draft. The most explosive running back in the draft, right? He's more explosive than Bijan was. Took the best linebacker in the draft, who they barely even played last year because they had two guys that started over him, but he still played a little bit. They took he the best. He play more and more as the He played more at the end of the year, yeah. They took the best uh, cor- nickelback slash safety who had ran a slow 40 time at the combine. So everybody lowered him down to draft. He ended up going to the second round. <laughs> he was amazing branch, which we all knew he was and from the tape. Everybody before he ran that 40, everybody saying he was the best safety in the draft should be a first round pick, a high top 15 first round pick. Then he ran a four, six 40 and then everybody dropped him in out of the first round and the lion stole him. And then they took a tight end, the second tight end off the, off the board who ended up being a freaking pro bowl tight end. He was in the pro bowl because he was making catches all over the place being awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He was Tucker Craft before Tucker Craft showed up. And then Tucker Craft looks like him. The Craft's a little bit bigger. And I would say that Laporte's got, he's a little bit smoother in route running and that kind of stuff. But, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just one of those things where the, the Lions attacked positions that are not valued in the NFL. Mm-hmm. And they took the best players of their positions and got Pro Bowl type players at all four positions. And the Packers took Van Ness, who barely saw the field. So what is smarter? Use your head. You got pick 25. You want to take the seventh best offensive tackle or the eighth best corner, or do you want to take the best center to replace your crappy ass center you have now? <laughs> I would take the best center. I, I don't know. Cause that guy could be a pro bowler. Yeah. Would you rather yeah. have a pro bowl center or a crappy ass corner who, you know, I mean, who's the eighth best corner in his freaking draft? It's dumb. <laughs> I don't know. It's just me. And then take shots later on, right? Yeah. Draft three corners. You got 11 picks. Draft three corners in the fifth round. One of them could be good. Carrington Valentine ain't too bad. Who's a seventh round pick? Yeah. But if you know you get in the best center, the guy that you know, like you've studied him, your scouts have studied him. It's a consensus throughout the NFL. This guy's a great center. That Powers Johnson, I think is what his name is, from Oregon or somewhere. That guy's supposed to be the cream of the crop at center. Well, let's draft him. Draft him in the first round, Goody. Stop prioritizing premium positions, but you're getting the eighth best guy at the premium position instead of the best guy at the position that nobody values, and that's how you win games. Take the guy who's the best guy at a position nobody values, period. I should be the GM. Of the pack, because I would first of all, Aaron Jones would still be there, and Rasul Douglas would still still be there. Number one, number two, Jair would be gone, gone. Period. Bye, Josh Myers. See ya. Out of here. It it fills out a team, and that's yeah. what you need is a team. You need a complete team to win. A few 
freakish athletes cannot win you a Super Bowl. They can't. Even at a quarterback, even if it's a quarterback. Especially they when they don't see the field. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, LVN didn't see the field much. No. Because no. he was fourth on the depth chart and he was a number 12 pick overall. Right. right. Like, what are we doing? I, I don't know. Look at the Lions. Their first four guys all were saw the field and were key contributors. And they got further than we did. Just saying. And, and they would they should have won that game if their coach yeah. wasn't a dumbass. Yep. They should have beat the 49ers. <laughs> yep. 100%. It wasn't the players' fault that they lost that game. It was the coach's fault. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And I know the Bucks probably got crushed. I was looking at it there for a second, but I can't oh, remember. Giannis play again, so I don't know. I know. And they're having Middleton's back, but Giannis is out. And I don't know what's going on. And plus, they're playing the Celtics, and the Celtics are always giving problems. I'll take a quick peek on what it is. I can't remember. Oh, they tightened it up. Oh, but they're going to lose. It's 120 to 116 in the fourth quarter with eight seconds left. It's like yeah. the Bucks are going to come There's up. There's no short. four point play. Well, there is actually, there is a four point play. They get fouled on a three pointer, make it. Who did it? Ooh, Bobby Portis got hot, got 24 points. Jesus, 24 points and 15 rebounds. Damn. Bobby Portis is so freaking good. That's he another one. Listen, <laughs> I know I'm not a genius. Okay. I'm close. But there's one thing I can do is I can tell you when a guy's good. Just from looking at him. From the first moment I saw Bobby Portis, what did I tell you, Jace? You loved him. You thought he was great. My favorite guy. Favorite guy. Because I like guys with heart. Guys with super effort. And they have they have, they don't they, they're not probably the greatest skilled guys in the world, but they're damn good. They're above average. They're good player. They're good skills with high high character and high high effort. Right? That's my kind of guy. That's like Micah Hyde, Aaron Jones, all the guys. Rasul Douglas. They're not top of the echelon when it comes to talent level, but they're top of the level when it comes to effort, knowledge, guy, just awesome dude. And then just really good player. And I'll take that any day of the week over the freak of nature who can make a play like nobody else, but then half the time doesn't show up because his head's not in the game. Zadarius Smith. Oops. Did I say that? Yeah. Because they also think that about themselves. Like they're not, they don't give all, all they can because they think they're that good that whatever they just, it, it's, they they've won at other levels because they were so talented. But when you get at the top levels, if you don't have the work ethic and the commitment, you're going to come up short. You know, isn't it? We got to get rid of all the other things, all the distractions, whatever is not about winning. Right, Ben? Do you, is this ringing any bells? Whatever's yeah, not about Rodgers, winning yep. just needs. Are we can to... talk about that now. <laughs> Vice president, he still hasn't shot that down yet. I am so glad he's gone. <laughs> I mean, uh, what a what I'm a just, joke! What a joke! Oh, it is a God. joke. The, the, whole, the guy, the man, is a joke. The Jets are so cursed. Oh my! I mean, they do it to themselves, but they holy do. shit, are they cursed? It's kind of hilarious. <laughs> it's like the Bears. So, uh, no, at least the Bears did. Well, you know, the Jets have one Super Bowl win. Yeah. The third the third one ever. <laughs> you know, and the Bears have one from, you know, 40 years ago, almost. Ugh. But. Wow. Oh, oh Lee's there. Lee, why is Lee. Lee always shows up an hour into the show. Lee, oh, what do you do on the first hour that you never he's hear? Not, he's probably working or something. Or maybe oh, okay. maybe he's like you. He's eating. He's eating. I wasn't eating. I was sleeping. Um, <laughs> anticipation means more than speed on defense. One hundred percent, David. That's why instinctive yeah. players who can read, rea- read and attack, are better than the ones that simply react. Damn, I just came up with that. It's not bad. All right. I think everybody Ooh. said that. It's nothing new. No, not in that. Not in that order. Not in those specific verbiage that I just used there. I don't know. Anyways, if anybody is bored and they want to waste a good two and a half hours of their day, go back yeah. and watch. Go watch. Go back and watch our Tampa Bay Buccaneer 
Packer loss review. Oh, is it bad? Just to see. Well, no, just it'll show you the Devondre Campbell, like, you know, because Baker Mayfield had the perfect passer rating. Oh, yeah. And and I put a bunch of, you know, if you, I don't know if you remember that show, but that show has the Devondre Campbell just kind of standing there looking at the quarterback, Baker Mayfield throwing it literally like one yard away from him. And Devondre <laughs> just kind of standing there and watching the ball go there. Was that, was that part of the coaching, too? Was that was like when the ball comes near you, don't try to don't try to I don't knock know. it down. Don't. Oh, Lee took the lady. Oh, Lee. All right, all right. Damn. All right. Yeah, do what you got to do, Lee. That's all right. all right. I like it. I like it. And yeah, by lady, I think you mean your dog, right? I mean, I'm guessing, but maybe uh, I'm wrong. Oh, no. I'm sorry, Why Lee. would you do that? That's not know. even. Does that mean? Lee, uh, if, I'll punch him in the face next time I see him. <laughs> Good for you, okay, bud? <laughs> I'm you just kidding. Lee's lady a dog? Like, no, I'm not. I, I didn't mean. That's pretty much what you did. I'm going to punch you in the face next I time. I didn't I say his lady was a dog. I thought that he didn't have a lady and he just took his dog out to eat. Just, you need to sh- just stop. All right. This beer's not stop. working yet. Damn it. Okay. Anyway, I'm just joking around, Lee. Anyway, um, let me just say this before we go. <sighs> I got to tell you about the Packers. Uh, the one thing with the Packers here that I'm looking forward to, Ben, and that is them completely surprising everybody in the draft in the first round because that's what they always do, right? Completely surprising everybody. They'll ca- we'll be thinking this. Goody will dodge and go left, right? He'll just that's what he always does. That's what he always does. We'll what see. do you think? David said, my son told me the last three weeks to quit complaining about Campbell. Oh, okay. All right. Well, listen to your son, David. We, Yeah, we don't, don't have to complain com- about him anymore because no, he's gone it's just, now. He's just, he just so – it's so crazy. Like, yeah, crazy like, thing, yeah. Just went went bonkers on it. Like, ah, the Bucks officially lost 122 to – one. they made a three before the end of the game, 122 to 119. Did Bobby Portis make that three? I bet you. No, Lillard made it. Damian Lillard. Okay. All right, anyway, the Bucks came up short to the Celtics tonight. They were down big at halftime, but they battled back. They're still going to be fine. Don't worry about the Bucs. Um, I don't know if there's anything else in the Packers' front. I would like to see Micah Hyde back. Yeah. I would love it. I don't know. We'll there's a long way to go. There's a lot of uh, draft selections. Oh, lastly, that was my last question for you. It's not Packer-related, but... Wouldn't it have been sweet justice and wouldn't it have been fun to have Viking Mo on our show if after the Vikings lost Kirk Cousins, they had assigned Baker Mayfield? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, Baker's good. He, he actually signed for pretty cheap. It's only like $33 million a year in quarterback world. That's not that bad for a guy who played pretty good. I would say you know, he said it. He's like, Listen, I like being here. I know it just it just goes to show you. I don't know. With this Aaron Jones stuff, I'm like Baker. I don't know. I got. I would take the money, but maybe nobody else wanted him. That's the other thing. You know what I mean? If nobody else wanted him, then he'll take what he can get. Same like AJ Dillon. Like I said last week on Monday, I was like, oh, now the Packers are signing AJ Dillon back. Yep. You said for it. cheap because they got to you know make the Packer fans happy because they let Aaron Jones go. They got to keep one of these two guys who are Packer favorites, and I was right. So. You know, I hate being right all the time, but I usually am. When we last came on, Aaron Jones was not a Packer, but he was not a Viking yet. How do you feel about oh, that? Oh, that's right. I feel great. I did not like his skull at the end of his press conference. That that actually <laughs> cut my soul a little bit. But he sounded pretty motivated. Like it, yeah, I know. But to do it that fast, I'm kind of like, mm, come on, Aaron Jones. Not that you can't scold on your first press conference. But he's pissed. That the Packers. I know he is. Like I said. Know. You well, that's the other thing about Devondre Campbell. He said in one of his tweets, he was like, yeah, when the Packers, when, when they went out on a, and, and said how much Aaron Jones and I were going to be brought back because we're important to the team. And I'm like, they never said Devondre Campbell was going to be brought back. I was definitely going to be on the team because he's important. No, 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 Devondre Campbell. They never said that about you. <laughs> not publicly, probably not privately. Um, I, I don't quite know what's up with that. But so... <laughs> Aaron Jones, they said, well, but not Devondre Campbell. But yeah, I mean, you know, I'm actually excited because I live in Minnesota. So, and there's a bunch of times when the stupid Vikings play at the same time as the Packers and they show the dumb Vikings game here. It makes me mad. So I'll have a reason to watch the stupid Vikings game now. 
And he'll get fed the ball quite a bit, you'd expect. Well, right? we'll see. I, the, I mean, they have the Vikings have a guy. I can't remember what the stupid Chandler. Name is. Chandler, yeah, who did yeah. pretty good last year, and that's the reason why they moved on from Madison. But um, I don't know if he's you know with with you know I don't know if they're going to plan on you know using Aaron Jones like the Packers did hardly ever. You know, like half. I mean, half the he's time and, he's cheap and he's on a one year deal. They're going to use the hell out of him. I would I use him. I would I would just give the ball a hundred times and just let him go. Yeah. I'll say this, Viking. Like I was, I would like to see Viking Mole here, so I could tell him, you know, like you, know, hey, my Viking Mole, you're gonna love Aaron Jones, man. Yeah, he's the man. This isn't like signing Devondre Campbell. We told you he sucks, and we were right. <laughs> this ain't like signing, you know, Greg Jennings after an injury, where you know, with a bad quarterback can't get in the ball. This is a guy who could do it by himself with a bad offensive line, a bad running offensive line. Um, but it's pretty cool. And I, I, you know, for me as a guy who lives in Minnesota, I will, I'm not going to be a Viking fan, but I'll definitely be an Aaron Jones fan. And uh, it'll be exciting to watch. I might get, a, I might get a Jones Viking jersey though. I might do it just to be a dick. Kevin O'Connell might find some fun ways to get on the ball too, Texas route and all that good stuff. Yeah. Apparently there's a guy on the Vikings who already has 33. So I don't know what's going to happen. If they're going to, if he's going to have 33 or not, but we'll, see. well, it's official that my, my birthday buddy Sean Clifford g- gave up his number for Josh Jacobs. So, oh, he did. Yep, he went to number six. Okay, yeah. okay. well that's cool. It'd yeah. be weird to watch a running back number eight back there, but hey, I know every time I see eight, I think of Anthony Dillwig. But what do I know? Anthony Dillwig. Dillwig. I was I was a Blair Keel guy. <laughs> that's why Jordan Love at number ten just messes me up because I'm like, wait a minute, that's Blair Keel. What are you doing? Blair Keel, Matt Flynn made that number famous. Come on, no, man. Blair Keel made it famous first. Oh, well, I, I don't know how you could ever look at eight and not think of Dillwig. I know Ryan Longwell wore it longer and was way better, but Dillwig left a left a mark on my memory. The name Dillwig left a mark on my memory. <laughs> and how bad he was. He was terrible. <laughs> no, he was another one of those tall, skinny white guys who... <laughs> Really throw it and had zero agility or speed or ability able to move in the pocket. He was a sitting duck. Guys like Reggie White loved him. <laughs> Eat him for lunch. Yeah. All right. Lee says that Aaron Jones fan for life. Can always be a yeah. fan of Aaron Jones no matter where he is or what he's doing. All right. Enjoy your uh, time, guys. Be good. Stay good. If they sign Lucas Patrick back, it'll be an emergency celebration show. But until then, yeah, we'll catch, otherwise, we'll catch you next week. All right. Be good, everybody. Peace out.